despite their high levels of enthusiasm, we are seeing that about half of all Asian Americans have not been contacted to participate by either party. So there's this kind of mismatch with a lot of enthusiasm, but a little bit less contact. And historically, Asian Americans have been the group that is contacted less than other groups. This is true for both parties. So many of you are wondering, where are Asian Americans? Where does their vote lie as we approach uh, the election in a couple weeks? And what we've been seeing is that Asian Americans have been growing in terms of their democratic partisanship for a long time. Asian Americans were a group that was more likely to be independent or nonpartisan compared to other groups. But little by little, we're seeing that these groups are across the groups, there are starting to be a fair number of Democratic registrants. I'll just give you a second to take a look here. Overall, Asian Indians, and again, that's the largest group in Virginia, are the group that leans most Democrat. And that is both in terms of vote choice, in terms of party identification, and in terms of policies. In terms of the presidential race, here we see, and we've seen all along, a lot of support for Joe Biden among the different Asian American groups. There is one exception, and that is Vietnamese Americans. So Vietnamese Americans are the only group we surveyed that is more likely to say they will vote for Donald Trump over Joe Biden. Why is that? It really has to do with partisanship. So Vietnamese are the group that is more likely to be Republican than Democrat. And that is because for decades, they have associated the Republican Party with anti-communist policies and partly what they were fleeing when many came to the U.S. Were, was a communist uh, regime. Still, we can see that Donald Trump is not a favorite among uh, Asian Americans. You can see that the unfavorable, the very unfavorable rates are really high. So one of the things that I look at is whether or not you see all you see these different national origin groups. Is there an Asian American political agenda? And I argue that despite our diversity, we are starting to see some political convergences. But to see those, you have to look beyond the stereotypes. So a lot of campaigns and elected officials will reach out to Asian Americans on based on two issues. And that's really informed by stereotypes. So they think that Asian Americans are hyper interested in education because of the model minority stereotype. They also think that they can reach out to Asian Americans based on immigration issues because not only are Asian Americans more likely to be foreign born than US born, but also this persistent stereotype that Asian Americans the, uh, are foreign born known as the forever foreigner stereotype. So when we look at the data, we see that like all Americans, Asian Americans are very concerned going into this election with jobs and the economy. Again, this was conducted over the summer. And education is an issue, right? But I just want to take a second to look at this issue more carefully. A lot of people think that Asian Americans are education voters because of cultural values. So some of you might have heard that Asian Americans have a special value for education, and that's why they're so interested in educational issues. But another explanation for why we see such high levels of both interest and academic achievement among Asian Americans is really our immigration laws and selective recruitment, what sociologists call hyper-selective immigration policies that select people from Asia to come to the U.S. who are both more educated than people in the U.S. and more educated than the people back home. And so we see that in the U.S., fully 50 percent of Chinese immigrants in the U.S. have a bachelor's degree. That is, they came to the U.S. with a very high level of education. In China, the rate is about 8 percent. Among Indians, it's actually even higher now, about 80% really of Indian immigrants have a bachelor's degree today, whereas about 15% of Indians of college age enroll in college in India. And we see the same patterns from other countries as well. So 
the vast majority of immigrants from South Korea and Japan have a bachelor's degree compared to much lower numbers in their countries of origin. So here we can reflect on what is driving high levels of educational attainment in the US. Is it Asian values or is it the structure of our immigration laws? Similarly, we see that the vast majority of international students come from Asia, and this group by definition is highly educated. So I bring this up because there is so much attention to this idea that Asian Americans hold a cultural value for education, and that ends up shaping how elected officials reach out to our groups. Again, another thing that most elected officials aren't paying attention to is that there are many groups in the Asian American community that, dis that demonstrate educational attainment levels that are lower than the US average. And these groups have come to the US through different mechanisms, not through high-skilled visas, H-1B visas, and family reunification, but family reunification, yes, and through refugee status. And so we see again that these groups also have Asian American, have Asian values. They have a value um, that it could be considered a cultural Asian American orientation, and yet they are not performing above the US average of 36%. In addition, we know that US immigration policy is shaping ideas about other groups. So in contrast to the Asian American populations I highlighted earlier, especially those from East Asia, South Asia, we see that Mexican educational achievement is higher in Mexico than among Mexican immigrants in the US. So just to wrap up this idea of educational values, one of the dangers I think of politicians and elected officials and parties reaching out to us and reinforcing this idea that education is the way to move Asian American voters is that it really assumes that other groups don't care as much about education when we know that all groups actually demonstrate a very high level of interest in education. And this is just one measure, but it's not the only measure, but it's pretty straightforward. People were asked, do you value a four-year college degree? Do you think it's necessary for success? And we see that Latinos surveyed value that four-year degree more than Asian Americans and Blacks more than whites. So that's the critique of the model minority stereotype and why I think it, different parties, elected officials need to expand their idea of what Asian Americans care about. All groups care about education, not just Asian Americans. They also tend to reach out to us with a focus on immigration. So here you can see that in terms of supporting a pathway to citizenship, the idea that undocumented immigrants should have the opportunity if they meet certain requirements to eventually become US citizens, we see that there is pretty high support. Overall, over half of Asian Americans do support this. But I think what's important to know here is that Asian Americans are not particularly progressive when it comes to immigration issues. Americans more generally do support this. So on the issues of immigration, Asian Americans look a lot like the rest of the population, even though they are a population that is majority immigrant. Recent research I've done shows that compared to Black Americans, Asian Americans have less are less supportive of progressive immigration policies, including those related to increasing levels of legal immigrants. So here I think it is again kind of a misreading of our population to think that we're going to be particularly open to immigration. We look a lot like the US population more generally, and we are less supportive of even legal immigration than Black Americans. So where do Asian Americans look distinct from the general population? It's actually not on education or on immigration. Asian Americans have long been much more likely to support universal health care than other Americans. And so you can see here that this is an important issue across all groups, including Vietnamese Americans who, as you recall, were the most likely Trump voters. So when we ask people for, about support for 
Obamacare, for instance, Asian Americans are very likely to support Obamacare, and they are mo more likely to express support than the general U.S. population. Here's another area where I think people get us wrong. Asian Americans are much more supportive of a bigger government with more services than a smaller government with fewer services than white Americans. And I think this is key because people have this idea that Asian Americans are conservative in terms of US fiscal policy, when in fact we see they're actually very supportive of a kind of social safety net and government spending to support that social safety net. So among all people of color in the US, what you see is that they're more likely to support a bigger government than a smaller government with fewer services. And it's the flip among white Americans. Asian Americans are also environmental voters. And so you rarely hear environmental groups or even the Democrats really reach out to Asian Americans based on issues like addressing climate change or, uh, or other kinds of issues related to the environment. And yet Asian Americans are likely to identify as environmentalists and express a very strong degree of support for federal interventions to address environmental degradation. Gun control. This is another issue that Asian Americans appear to be very distinct on compared to the general U.S. population. So when it comes to stricter gun control laws, you can see that there's a lot of support and that includes Republican-leaning groups like Vietnamese. So this really is an area where you see that Vietnamese are partisan, that is, they tend to be more Republican, but their policy views sometimes diverge from the mainstream Republican viewpoints. So let's talk about another kind of lens to understanding this election. It's hard to think about this election without thinking about race and discrimination. So one of the ways in which we've seen uh, racism kind of infuse this election is that Trump has been using the term the China virus or the Kung flu virus. And while this is aimed at China, it has this kind of spillover effect that I want to talk about here today. So a lot of Asian Americans, over half, are worried about hate crimes and harassment as a result of COVID-19 um, and the association with Asia around COVID-19. Interestingly, you can see that Asian Indians are the group that's most likely to express this worry. And that might be because of past experience with hate crimes after 9-11, this this group is attuned to the ways in which uh, the Asian American population can quickly be caught up in racism around international, um, international incidents. So here you can see that both Asian and Black Americans, so here's a kind of interesting comparison, have been very concerned about racism related to the coronavirus. And you can see here, that especially when it comes to, for very different reasons, wearing a mask in public, Black and Asian Americans worry that people might be more suspicious of them. So why does it matter that Trump uses terms like the China virus or the Kung flu? We can see that both most people in the U.S. think it's inappropriate. And why do they think it's inappropriate? Because I think they know that it can actually uh, boomerang onto po populations in the U.S. So you can see this kind of conflation. So if anyone watched the debate yesterday, last night, Trump went from talking about COVID-19 and blaming the spread on China and then pivoted pretty seamlessly to accusing Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leader, of dancing and partying uh, in Chinatown 
shortly after the outbreak. And that just showed this kind of conflation of thinking about people in China and then thinking about people who had been living in the U.S. in a U.S. city, um, San Francisco's Chinatown, and making this kind of implicit association that by hanging out in Chinatown, Nancy Pelosi was consorting with the enemy. That is driven by this idea that Asian Americans are perpetually foreign threats. So you can see here that some people recognize that. In fact, the majority of people in the US think that those terms are inappropriate. But it's also true that this kind of language has become part of, uh, connected to partisanship. So Republicans actually are less likely to think that this, um, these terms are inappropriate. Democrats are more likely to think they're inappropriate, but still almost one in five think that these terms are appropriate, even among Democrats. Does this matter? I think we're starting to see some empirical evidence that these kinds of terms actually start to affect people's views about Asians in the US. So this study that was published earlier this year shows that as the term China virus, for instance, started to trend on Twitter, then people started to exhibit more implicit biases towards Asian Americans. In addition, we can see this connection that this is a pretty early study done in April. People who had unfavorable I uh, ideas about Chinese in the US, about Asian Americans more generally, were also more fearful of the coronavirus. And so race is actually, attack, uh, is actually attached to people's um, ideas about illness here. And that's a long-standing kind of association in US history between Asian Americans um, and uh, feelings of them being disease carriers, for instance. Finally, we see that this is not a direct association, but as the outbreak started to um, become more clear, then people started to exhibit more negative attitudes towards Asian Americans. This is really this kind of contradiction, I think. So what we see is that in the US, Asian Americans are not only being affected by uh, negative attitudes and these kind of biases because of this maybe incendiary language, but that COVID is having a pretty big effect on Asian American communities more generally. And so you can see here that the death rate for Asian Americans, this is just one county in San Francisco, is higher than for other groups. So you are mostly young people. What do young people care about going into this election? So we studied uh, 18 to 34 year olds who were some of them registering to vote for the first time. And what we found in this survey is that compared to their, not surprisingly, compared to their older cohorts, 18 to 34 year olds were more likely to be Democrats and more progressive on every issue that I've talked about so far and other issues as well. One of the issues that we see a real generational divide on has to do with shifting funding from law enforcement to other programs. This issue was very, um, got a lot of attention, especially after the murder of George Floyd. And you can see this kind of generational divide where young people are much more likely to agree that this shift in spending should take place compared to the general population of Asian Americans. At the same time, you can see that overall, Asian Americans support this kind of shift. Asian American young people are also much more familiar and support Black Lives Matter at higher rates than older Asian Americans. So you can see here that the vast majority, 70% of younger Asian Americans are favorable towards the movement for black lives. That compares to 43% of, I can't see, sorry, um, of 46% of 
older, the very oldest cohort among Asian Americans. But overall, there is majority support for Black Lives Matter. So one of the things that I think is important is there's been this huge movement among younger Asian Americans to help inform the older generation about systemic racism, about anti-Black racism in particular. One of the things that is key, though, is that I think we need to place this kind of intergenerational conversation in context. Yes, older Asian American voters are more conservative than younger, their younger cohort um, and their younger, um, younger Asian Americans, but compared to older white voters, older Asian American voters are not as conservative on race or other issues because I think this older generation of Asian Americans has also experienced racism and their political orientations have been shaped by encounters with discrimination. Finally, I want to just talk about people's reaction to the anti-Asian bias we've seen uh, over the past six months. And I think it's really critical to point out that Black Americans were among the first to publicly stand up for Asian Americans who were facing COVID-related anti-Asian bias. And so very early in the pandemic and as the level of harassment started to tick up, the harassment directed towards Asian Americans, we saw the Congressional Black Caucus, Congressional Hispanic Caucus, take a public stand to condemn anti-Asian bias. In New York City, the Attorney General, uh, who's also Black American, launched a hotline for people to report discrimination. And so we saw this like very early uh, support from Black and Latino elected officials. This also extended to uh, civil rights leaders. So the NAACP, UNIDOS, um, Legal Defense Fund, those leaders were there when Asian Americans were under attack. And I think this is interesting because there is this debate over affirmative action happening right now where Asian Americans are on the whole supportive of affirmative action. So this is, these are the data from our survey showing that we do see a lot of support for affirmative action across the board. You'll also note that Chinese are the least likely to support compared to other groups. So you see this big kind of variation across groups, but on the whole, 70% of Asian Americans support affirmative action and race conscious admissions. Even among Chinese, more support than oppose. But the face of the anti-affirmative action movement today, and it has been effective, is really Asian American. And this kind of fight against Racial equity has extended to places like New York City, and even in my um, my county, we're seeing efforts to integrate and to provide more access to students who've been left out of, let's say, specialized high schools or gifted and talented programs. We're seeing Asian Americans really f fight those programs. Here you can see that in this really kind of uh, poignant way where this this person uh, in New York City is holding up a sign that says equity is a code word for anti-Asian. And I think we're at this kind of crossroads. So on the one hand, we are seeing uh, a lot of support from other communities of color in the time when Asian Americans are facing COVID-related uh, discrimination. And while we see a lot of, of progressivism on racial equality among the Asian American population as a whole, there is a group of very effective activists who are actually making some pretty um, effective inroads into dismantling things like affirmative action. And so I'll just end with this, that what this election context tells us is that Asian Americans are poised to make a difference. But we're also in this kind of powerful, at the same time, precarious position. Will we 
reinforce existing hierarchies or will we prove a more transformative force? And so if you look at these data as a whole, what you see is we're trending Democrat. There's some progressive, some real progressive um, consensus around healthcare, gun control, the environment, but there's also pockets of real resistance and active uh, opposition to a racial equity agenda. And so that opposition, I think, could really be the mark that Asian Americans leave on US politics and could shatter this kind of rainbow coalition that has been fostered over time. And so I hope we also have a chance to talk about that as we talk about the broader 2020 election and Asian Americans' roles in it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Janelle. Um, and uh, we're doing our Zoom claps. Um, much appreciated. And uh, what I wanted to do is um, I. Um, Professor Wong um, made sure that she would save some time for people to ask questions. So I know um, that some of the students may have to take off at once. I'd, I wanted to let students uh, who had questions start off. Um, and uh, so I will kind of try to um, moderate. So if you want to ask a question, just uh, raise your hand. And uh, Gabriela, um, you had your hand up, so I'll let you go first. Yeah, um, I had a question kind of in the interest of disaggregation. I remember in the 2016 election, um, compared to other Asian American groups, Filipino Americans and Vietnamese Americans um, had like higher rates of voting um, Republican and voting for Donald Trump. And I was just wondering what that looks like going into the 2020 election, um, if that has shifted at all, because I know, at least anecdotally, for a lot of Filipino Americans, it was sort of like a single issue um kind of vote um regarding like abortion which has definitely been prevalent with like the amy coney barrett hearing so i was just wondering what that looks like four years later if that's changed at all for those two groups uh, janelle you're muted so can you see the screen here i think i'm sharing right Okay, yes. so let's go look at that, the, um, the vote choice again. What we're seeing, you know, I think um, that was notable um, in the past survey that Asian, that Filipino Americans were trending a little bit more Republican in, uh, compared to the past. And one of the things that uh, I noticed over the, between the 2016 election and now is that Filipino Americans have actually become the, I think the second, second or third highest income Asian American group. And that's a real sea change. Um, but this, uh, this election, we're, we're not seeing uh, Filipinos particularly supportive of, um, of Trump. I think that abortion as an issue um, has not, even though we see the um, Amy Coney Barrett um, Supreme Court appointment kind of mobilizing people, what the group that it's mobilizing is mainly Democrats. And so um, there is this, you know, when we look, so Filipino Americans have, are, are more likely to be Catholic than other groups, but when surveys of Catholics done in the last couple of weeks have really shown that, you know, that that group is split in terms of vote choice and the Supreme Court appointment is not driving Catholics votes to the extent that you might expect. And so, you know, I think what we're seeing here is overall, there is a kind of core support for Trump that's a, that's kind of unshakable across all different demographic groups. Um, and that includes Asian Americans. You do see this this group here, um, you know, there, there's a, there are, there's a proportion of people in every national origin group that is supporting Trump. But that group tends to get sometimes more attention than maybe is warranted. So there were so many people who were, for instance, focused on um, Indian Americans going to this uh, Howdy Modi event in, with, with Trump in Texas um, earlier in the spring. And it just, 
That group has been consistently uh, Democratic, has in survey after survey, has shown uh, strong support for um, for Joe Biden. And it's also, you know, I think we all are like hyper aware of our family members who might be supporting Trump. But in fact, if you look at the broader population of Asian Americans, it's the group is just not leaning towards Trump. Um, thank you. And uh, do we have any other? Do we have other questions? Um, other hands? Francis. Thank you, Jamel, for that wonderful, thorough talk. Could you tell us about the independent spirit of the Chinese Americans and what else you can tell us on that 41%? I think that's very interesting. Yeah, so I've actually done a sort of deeper dive into Chinese um, and their partisanship. And we do see that Chinese are more likely to um, be nonpartisan than other groups. What happens is it basically translates into a more moderate, um, slightly less progressive kind of politics. And so um, if you look at Chinese who identify as Democrat, they look pretty distinct from this group of independents. Um, the group of independents is much more moderate when it comes to issues, especially of racial equality, affirmative action, and immigration. And so uh, where will this group go? I mean, so part of it is that um, traditionally in U.S. politics, independents are a little bit less informed about the issues of the day. They're a little bit less likely to come out and vote. I think it, in the end, it's it can be um, damaging to the likelihood of Chinese Americans to be mobilized because political parties, while this group could be considered a swing vote, also could be, parties don't like to mobilize groups where they don't know which way they're going to vote. And so um, it can actually lead to demobilization of some groups, and that could be um, a kind of negative uh, fallout from high levels of, of lack of partisanship. However, when you compare across generational cohorts, you see that, you know, nonpartisan uh, independents and nonpartisans, that group starts to decline with, with more exposure to the U.S. political system, especially over generations. And so I think this is really a function of, part of immigration. Um, next question. Uh, Professor, I wonder if I could ask a question. Yeah, go ahead, Noah. Um, so I don't know if you uh, did any um, work on like sort of the Democratic primaries or anything. But I was wondering mm -hmm. how uh, demographically the primaries were playing out um, in terms of like support for the different candidates for Biden got the nomination? Yeah, that's a great question, Noah. And uh, the, the survey data I collected over the primaries was focused on California. So I did a survey um, during primary season, but it only included California voters, um, Asian American registered voters. What we saw there, um, you know, there were some interesting things. One of the things that is was notable is that the majority of Asian Americans during the primary season, we're supporting Joe Biden. So they have been Biden supporters, and I think that maps on pretty well to this sort of, you know, kind of moderate uh, democratic uh, orientation that we see in the data that I showed today. So Joe Biden um, is a very popular candidate among Asian Americans. Uh, Kamala Harris was not getting a lot of um, support Andrew Yang was getting some support, but still even among Chinese um, who share his national origin background, we saw that uh, Biden was outperforming Yang the whole time. Among younger voters, you know, Bernie Sanders was doing better than among older voters. 
other kinds of interesting data were that um, we looked at uh, campaign contributions and Cory Booker was getting the mo the highest level of contributions from Asian Americans, especially in the first quarter, and that was really due to um, to mobilized Indian Americans in New Jersey. That was that was being driven. Andrew Yang started to pick up on campaign contributions as the rate as the primaries went on, but wasn't getting a lot of support from even Asian Americans early on. Thank you. All my students in my Asian American politics class were supporting Bernie and Elizabeth Warren. I'm from, I'm from Silver Spring, so yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> Marilyn, the house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, next question. Um, Emma, go ahead. Yes, I was wondering if you could speak to voter turnout and what that looks like for Asian Americans. So I'm not sure if your survey had covered turnout, but are there certain groups that are more likely to participate in the voting process? And if you looked at eligible voters, I know you touched on enthusiasm, but like in terms of actual turnout, do you have any um, data, statistics and demographics? Yeah, so uh, turnout among Asian Americans, including those who are eligible, tends to be among the lowest, so Asian American and Latinx, they turn out at kind of the high 30s usually. Um, and But we have seen record turnout in 2018 among Asian Americans. Um, there are some differences within the Asian American population. And so the groups that are, the group that's most likely to participate are Indian Americans and the groups that are le less likely are Chinese and Vietnamese. This actually I think has to do a lot with mobilization too. So Asian Americans tend to be a group as you saw from the data that aren't, uh, people, people don't contact them as much, the political parties don't contact them as much. And that's partly because they, even though they're growing, they're the fastest growing groups in uh, swing states, they are still very small in those swing states. Asian Americans as a whole are 4% of the U.S. electorate. It's still a really small group. It's a group that, uh, you know, the naturalized voters among Asian Americans actually demonstrate lower levels of English proficiency than, natural, than, than Latinx uh, naturalized citizens. And so, it's a hard group to mobilize, but it's also a group that is kind of disadvantaged, I think, by concentration in the um, in these safe districts and safe states like California, New York, and Hawaii. You just don't see the parties doing much there, and that then leads to this vicious cycle where Asian Americans aren't aren't outreach to, and then outreach actually affects levels of participation too. So I'm going to jump in with a, um, since also I have some of my students here and uh, we're doing Asian American demography and law, I wanted to ask a question for the class regarding um, survey data. So um, I was wondering, one, we see that frequently, especially like with the Pew report, the failure to break up our Asian groups, disaggregate Asian American groups. I was wondering, like, um, you're doing a lot of survey data that does this. Was it difficult to establish these um, survey projects? Um, and what are some of the difficulties in trying to get the Hmong and other like refugee groups that tend to be um, not captured in a lot of the survey data that we see? Yeah, I mean, the, the best data um, on Asian Americans is really the kind of demographic data that you refer to. Um, like the American Community Survey or um, the Current Population Survey, those data are high quality because they have a lot of people. Um, Pew's survey data, when you the data I showed from Pew, includes only English-speaking Asian Americans because they only survey Asian Americans, and so that leads to a bias. Online surveys tend to capture not only people who are more likely to speak English, 
but younger people, non, non-immigrants, and Democrats. And so we try to uh, kind of triangulate in on this population by using multiple methods to do outreach, including uh, doing a phone survey, which as you know, is really difficult in this day and age because people don't, how many of you have answered a survey on your phone, um, like actually picked up and answered a survey? Almost nobody, right? You will, you hardly will do an, okay, <laughs> Dinesh does it. No, I was so excited because- Dr. Sahoni does it. I, He's like, no, I, no me. it was one time when I got this kind of uh, national survey. I was so excited. I'm like, yes, talk to me. And then I started bugging them about their methodology. And I think they were like, I just got hired to do this survey. Please don't bother me. <laughs> yeah. So the survey response rates tend to be really low, like two to three percent um, for online and even our telephone surveys. Uh, here's what we do try to outreach based on, you know, a number of factors and we do our telephone surveys, we will get um, a, a pretty high proportion of foreign born and that's important because the majority of Asian Americans in the US, including among the voting population are foreign born. So if you don't capture that population, you really don't capture, um, you know, who we are and don't get a, a, an accurate picture. At the same time, the best way to survey is really um, one that is based on the numbers of Asian Americans in the population. That costs about $10 million to do. Um, so far, no one I know has done that perfectly and has and it's very rare. So what we try to do is do the survey in language and try to capture as many different groups as we can. And surveying even smaller groups. So serving 4% of the population is extremely hard. Serving groups that are smaller than 4% is almost, is, is very challenging. And so we were able to, um, you know, survey Hmong, Pacific Islanders, Cambodians in a survey of California, but for the national sample, it's really, really hard. There's almost no um, groups that have any kind of registered voter list of Hmong or Cambodians that's national. And it's, and it's, and Lao um, people too, that's a group that we would love to learn more about, but it's hard to capture. So, you know, these surveys have to be translated, back translated, um, and think about translating some of these political terms and these issues about race. It's really difficult. Thank you. Um I'll take a couple of last questions and then we can uh, thank Professor Wong for coming. I know that I said students first, but I see some of our faculty here. Um, so uh, any other uh, questions, um, uh, please go ahead and ask. And you can just unmute and ask since I can't see everybody. All right. so. Um, thank you very much. And then I do have one final um, kind of uh, question comment. So if some of our students um, want to get involved and active in mobilizing voting and so forth, um, uh, that'll be our last question. What should they do? So there is a group called APIA Vote that I work really closely with. They have actually an ambassador program where students can serve as ambassadors to do nonpartisan get out the vote. Um, that's one way. For those of you who are, um, you know, interested in let's say supporting affirmative action, there's a there's actually a ballot measure in 26 uh, in California where you they're looking for phone bankers every day. It's they're doing these kind of text um, text banking, and so that's another way. Um, so if you're interested in kind of nonpartisan get out the vote that's national, APIA vote is the place to go. And if you want to um, contact me, I can put you in touch with their organizers. And also in Virginia, NACASEC. NACASEC Virginia is doing a lot of GOTV and they're also doing um, get out the vote, not just in Virginia, but in Pennsylvania. So. You know, I think that's one of the best ways that Virginia-based people can get involved.
Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Professor Wong, for the wonderful talk. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, a nice round of applause. You can unmute, and then we will finish for today. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Great to see you. And Bye, everyone. Have a good election season. <laughs> Bye. Don't panel. forget to vote. Yeah, there's a 2 p.m. panel with uh, students on the pandemic. I put the link up there. Hi, Veronica. Oh, Thank you, Janelle. That was wonderful. All right. So nice to meet you, Dr. Aguas. Bye-bye. Well, this is Francis. <laughs> Bye, Francis. Thanks, thanks. Janelle. That was wonderful. Um, Janelle, thanks so much. Um, I'll give you a quick call right after this. Um, okay. Sounds just good. Just to say hello. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. And Francis, I think you have the recording. So I stopped the recording. And Perfect. now I'm going to stop the stream.